Welcome to Watching Silent Films. My name is Yi Fong. With me are my co-hosts Bob and Lily. Greetings. Hey, Bob. Hey, Good Lily. evening. Hello. And uh, what we do in this podcast is watch silent films or series of shorts and talk about them. This week, we're going to talk about Genuine from uh, 1920 by director Robert Wayne. Now, uh, before we get going there, any classic type movies you guys watch recently? You don't have to have any. Just curious. Yes, I watched one right after I finished Genuine. It was only about 10 minutes long. <laughs> what was it about? Which one is it? So it's called The Portrait, and it's a silent horror film from 1915. Um, the, <laughs> the information is in Russian, so I'm not exactly sure what it exactly says. But um, it kind of is like a take on the Dorian Gray story mm. where the man sees he can't look at himself in the mirror or the portrait but what someone commented about is uh that this short is based on this author gogol his short fiction of the portrait um and apparently this original film was 45 minutes long but only about eight minutes of it survived and then like the author who the uh excuse me the youtuber who put up the film talked back to this other person who was like oh you know maybe there's a lost copy somewhere but uh it, it was creepy i liked it i i don't know why i really like the silent horrors they just because you know they're not as scary i think it makes them more intriguing because obviously they're not going to have jump scares in them mm-hmm. not exactly like in our sense because mm-hmm. there's just a, a big loud noise and you're like oh nothing's really like scary i'm so into like psychological thrillers Mm. so this wasn't exactly one of those but the the there's this guy who buys a portrait of like this kind of ugly dude (laughs) so he takes it home and then he ends up cleaning it up and then it's this even uglier dude who just stares at him in his sleep so then he's horrified (laughs) and then the guy like in the painting is always looking out at him while he's trying to sleep and then eventually he does come out of the the painting and he i don't think he tries to kill him i honestly don't know what he's doing it looks like he's just wrapping some change (laughs) but uh bizarre i i liked it for what it was i know it's kind of like what are you doing i have no idea (laughs) but uh that was it uh it's good if you want to kill 10 minutes (laughs) so i'd recommend what was it it. called again The, the portrait the portrait what what year was it about? 1915. Oh, wow. Neat. Russian short silent horror. Nice. Uh, they call it a true gem. I'm not sure if the, uh, the, the filmmaker is called, oh, geez, Rosinsky or something uh, like Sta- that. Sterevich. Vladislav Sterevich. 1915, The Portrait. Hmm. Only about eight minutes out of the 45 minutes still exists today. That's probably yeah. what we watched. Oh, wow. Definitely. Yeah, it doesn't even mention the director. But that's interesting. It must oh, it must just be, you know, it goes from English to Russian. Never right. mind. So, we have seen... you That movie you watched, that same director uh, also directed something we watched before. If you remember, he, he did a lot of animation. So, one of the animation he did was a, a short called the revenge of the cinematic operator i i remember the title but i don't remember what it was about yes. that was one of the very first ones right yeah early days so it's hmm. like um basically it's the the beetle um oh the going oh, to the admire the guy? dragonfly yeah the bug uh, guy yeah that was, i hated that one. yeah but anyways it's uh <laughs> it's it's the same guy and that in his earlier days, because that was uh, he did that Revenge of the Cinematic Operator in 1912. But uh, and then he he would mix he would often do live action as well. So it's not just that, but he he's most well known for those uh, stop motion animation hmm. type business. So I don't know if you remember that, Bob. I don't I don't remember if you were part of that. No, podcast. not that good call. Yeah, but what what this guy did was uh, 
So you know the technique for like claymation, right? You take clay, mold it to a shape. Oh yeah. Film it stop motion, but oh yeah. What this guy did was he took real bugs that are already dead, mm. pin it, and then did stop motion with. I've seen I've seen the short bugs. on that. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly. very very amusing. Yeah. There's num- there's a number of them actually. So yep. but he's most well known for that. Take that sort of freaky, <laughs> yeah. and, f- and funny at the same time. Right. Right. He's, there's a lot of, uh, it's like, you know, anthropomorphized, Yep. you know, what the bugs are. To, to, to oh, yeah. It was, it was very funny. Like, one was a salesman and rode, yeah. one was riding a bike, cockroach riding a bicycle. I mean. Right. All sorts so, of things like that. So funny. How about you, Bob? Did you catch anything this week? I saw in 1965, The Great Race. It's, uh, let's see, uh, Tony Curtis, Jack Lemmon, Natalie Wood, Ooh. and as uh, secondary characters of uh, Keenan Wynn and Robert Falk. And uh, it's like Around the World in 80 Days, sort of, but it's very silly. Um, have either of you seen The Villain with Kirk Douglas and Arnold Schwarzenegger? What year was that? Ooh. The Villain? Yeah. Uh, the villain is probably early seventies. Oh yeah, that would very, be a very young Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, that would be out of the my realm of uh. <laughs> for sure. Very silly stuff, like like indestructible villains who like get hit by cannons and right. and they're all black and and smoking but never die, you know. Right. Right. <laughs> it's a very silly movie. <laughs> They tend to, in that era of time, uh, in the 65, The Great Race, and even the early 70s, the film industry was basically kind of in some sort of a recovery mode because the television decimated the business, right? A lot of people are like, I can watch stuff at home for free. Why go Mm. to movie theaters? And so uh, 50s and 60s and probably the early 70s were... Uh, very trying times for the film film industry because they had to compete with free, and so it's one of the reasons why they came up with stuff like uh, widescreen, stereophonic sound, uh, and, and uh, Cinerama or IMAX. All these uh, multi stuff that the TV formats. couldn't do for you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't on at home. You might have a screen, but you still can't match. Like you know, Lawrence Arabia is why. Right. Like all these big epics and races, like. TV still can't compete with uh, these type of gimmicks. So, like, yep. like you were saying, around the world, like that's the era of time where in these type of yeah. films are very popular because they wanted to obviously make money, and part of making money is to do things that your tel- television can't do. Which is funny nowadays because television, at least in the current streaming uh, industry-wise, is is the most popular form of storytelling and film medium is effectively uh, like dead or dying you know right now mm-hmm. <laughs> but anyways it's so funny to look at the reversals that happen throughout film history right mm. yeah anyways uh, yeah it's cool those are all somewhat kind of classics in, in some sense in their own right especially of the era of time right so yeah uh, I don't think I saw anything in the classic realm. I caught up on other non-classic stuff. <laughs> but uh, let's uh, keep rolling here. So um, let's get into this film by Robert Wynn. We're kind of back on track with uh, part of my reasoning for this to kind of catch up with Robert Wynn and all of the films that he's done and one of the first few podcasts we've done was Dr. Calgary as well as the hands of Orlock. And those are so fantastic. And that, uh, I thought it'd be nice to kind of fill in the gap of the other parts of this filmography that, uh, kind of our deeper cuts. Um, I think I can't remember who somebody wrote a book called beyond Dr. Caligari or something, which means there's more to Robert Wynn than just that one movie. He's most well known for that. And the secondary sort of, more less well known but still 
just as well known as the hands of Orlock. And between the two, most people hmm. kind of attribute him to that just that one or two series of movies. Hey. You had a question? Oh, you've already you've already re- reviewed both of those movies. Oh yeah, that was actually like the, the one or two episodes right before you started. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll go back and watch both of those. Yeah, yeah, they're they're all. I mean, Cal- Caligari. At least you've heard it, right? That's one of the mm-hmm. more, most famous uh, silent films of all time. Just like uh, Potemkin, it's pretty up there. Yeah, but this director has done like you know. You know, tens if not hundreds of movies, including shorts, for maybe, mo- obviously most of which is lost, right? And we've mm-hmm. only gotten one or two intact of all of those. And so we're kind of going through his filmography of the ones that are available that we have access to on YouTube, whatever varying qualities they appear on there. And so the first, one of the first one we dipped back was Fear, remember? that was, So that was Robert mm-hmm. Wayne again. And now we're kind of back on track with uh, Genuine 1920. Which this particular copy we'll, we'll try to put into show notes, but um, it appears I don't know for sure, but it's it looked like this copy was a French intertitle copy, which means Robin Wynn's German, but he may have ex- sort of um, uh, you know this might have been a a foreign market copy outside of Germany, and so you know maybe he uh, uh, maybe the 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 film print that was found of this movie was only had French intertitles and that's the only copy that you saw in there. Mm-hmm. So anyways, um you know as I watched the film I realized um I didn't know it was the same director as Fear and it makes sense because uh the artist study um looked like the same set to me as the room in Fear where the relic yes, was being kept. Absolutely, absolutely. But I don't know for sure. It wouldn't surprise me if they repurpose sets mm-hmm. to save money. And this is only about four or five years after Fear as well. So not not too far. But this genuine 1920 uh, film is a follow-up uh, after The Cabinet of Dr. Gallery, Caligari, which is the 1919 film. And he used the same writer and cinematographer, kind of the same team. And even like from back then, you could see directors using same teams of artists. Because nowadays you see a lot of partnership like that, like the same type of people that work with the same type of, you know, DP and actors, and they're kind of a team, and they kind of just do different material. And so even back then, people preferred to do that. It's just a comfort level thing, you know. When you have a working professional relationship and you have a shorthand with somebody that can help you do something great, you're gonna just keep doing right. But anyways. Caligari was massively successful, but then came this movie. <laughs> so, mm. uh, did not, you know, succeed in the same way as Caligari. So, um, anyway, so the most, um, I don't know what the 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 most intact copy had been a forty three edited down version for the longest time, um, and. Uh, whenever this, uh, when did this YouTube, this was, uh, YouTube videos uploaded in 2018. So somebody somewhere found a copy of this, uh, in 2018 and, and uploaded it. So anyways, um, oh, I guess the author also commented back saying, uh, he wished he could remember. It may have originally come from sort of alpha video DVD, but that's a guess. So. At some point in time, there was a complete copy of it somewhere. <laughs> and just like many, many stories of silent film in their histories, uh, many silent films are just lost forever, right? So mm-hmm. anyways, so what, are, what is your take on this, especially you, Lee, because you, you, you obviously had seen um, Caligari or just recently seen it. And what do you, if you were an audience back in 1920, you just saw Caligari, and then the year after, you're like, oh, the same director as Caligari. I'm going to go watch it. And then what do you think of this one? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to start, I actually thought this movie came before Caligari because right. I noticed uh, all the, you know, the designs right away. 
So I was like, oh, maybe the, cause, but it wasn't as striking. So I was just, you know, I just thought, oh, maybe this is just the before and Caligari is after. Yeah, because the German expressionistic sets jump. is what Liv is referencing. Yeah. Because I thought it was just such a big jump. So I was like, okay, so it makes sense that you would start kind of smaller scale and then go hardcore to see how your audiences will react to it. But, excuse me, no, it's, uh, it was flipped. Um, well, as we were talking about before the podcast, uh, in our particular viewing format, it was in French and I did not realize, uh, well, the, excuse me, the intertitle cards were in French and I didn't realize you could close caption them into English. So, um, I was translating all of them through Google Translate, trying to understand what was happening. Um, brutal. Yeah, I and I stopped midway through because I was like, "Oh no, I'm just gonna have to try to understand." Because I took French in high school and I got very good at it, at like w- very you know well enough to read it, and I could speak it okay, but I was definitely stronger reading. Uh, but yeah, seeing this and not having done French in almost ten years, I'm just like, "Oh my god, what are those words? What does mm. it say? What are we saying?" <laughs> I could get. Some things, like some parts, never go away. Like when she's like, "Je suis genuine," or <laughs> just like, "Okay, I'm genuine, whatever." Um, but for me, because I kind of kept stopping the film, going back and forth between the intertitle cards, translating them, I, I, and um, because this particular film on YouTube had no music, I was listening to a different soundtrack, which did rotate i was listening to lo-fi beats those are kind of just i don't know i guess you would equal them to smooth jams with no uh li- uh no words but i don't think i was able to get the full effect of this movie just because i was kind of like what's going on i don't understand i i didn't appreciate this movie as much as i enjoyed caligari um so i but I think because of that, I, I, well, now that I know I can get the English subtitles, I want to watch it again so I can actually figure out what's going mm. on. Yeah, it's terrible playing catch up the whole time. Yeah. But I don't think you really have to go rewatch it only because it is my opinion is like the beauty of silent films is that you don't often need a lot of intertitles to figure out what's going on. You know what I mean? Like the actual visuals communicate so much right well in this i think it was because the quality wasn't the best either that is also true yeah the actual visual picture quality was was like vhs copy probably yeah which is i mean i'm not going to complain about that i'm happy we have anything at all it's just not understanding what you know what they're saying and then not being able to see what they're doing because i couldn't really understand who genuine was i thought she was like a prostitute or something taken off the street right and they said she was like a they called her a high priestess it's like what do you do that's not much different (laughs) yeah it's a it's a kind of a character yeah yeah and then wikipedia well yeah i definitely had to look at the wikipedia after dealing with all that i'm like oh my god what did i just watch and they call her like you know oh seductress you know getting men to fall in love with her but i was like who are these dudes <laughs> right right i felt the same way even with the subtitles yeah exactly so overall uh, if you were able to sort of uh understand it then it would have uh i guess made more sense for you i guess i believe so yeah i i uh okay was that did you have anything else I'm I don't know. I mean mm, Sorry, I'm trying to find like just my notes on genuine. It's I mean, I think the title's supposed to be ironic, would you say? Because she, I mean, well maybe not cuz she's kind of her character is what she is. I don't know. I'm not well, sure you... that the translation of the name into English conveys maybe what it means in German, and I'm not sure that the name means anything but the name. Right. Yeah, maybe I'm just trying to think deeper into it, but it's because you know sometimes you know I 
I like things that have plays playing on words and double meaning. Right. So I was like, well, is she really genuine? I kept is thinking she... the same thing throughout the film. And I went, why doesn't she name that? And I kept coming up with the same answer. Like, that must be just a word like Rose. You know? like <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if you... Uh, let's see... So I think what you got, what we got to do is kind of figure out what the German word for genuine and kind of translate it back into English. <laughs> right. And then I think you'll get a better sense of, um, you'll get a better sense of uh, what uh, I guess that means after that. And if that makes sense, what I'm trying to say. Well, let's hmm. see. I'll, I'll, try, I'll try that right now. Apparently, well, looking it, online too, there's an on Silentology mm-hmm. also on WordPress.com. They have an article here about obscure films, genuine a tale. Of, they call it genuine a tale of a vampire, which I also yeah, saw that translation. Exactly, that's that's it, part of the translation. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. But they're like, oh, she's not a vampire; she's a succubus, which yeah. is basically a hoe. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's a, it's a mythological character, and yeah. I think once you understand. That that then the rest of the story I think makes more sense because you you know the whole uh, mythology of that mm-hmm. the, the the whole thing because if you I think if you understand the whole concept of the the so the just to explain I guess if for the listeners who don't understand or what what the concept what I'm, we're referring to is apparently this is a Latin word. Uh, for late Latin, succubus, paramour, to lie beneath, uh, under, to lie, and there there are many derivations of that uh, word, and it comes from the late uh, 14th century. So it's kind of like a demon or supernatural entity in folklore in female form, and essentially it appears in a dream to seduce men, usually through sexual activity, and according to religious traditions, it uh, can uh there's the connection yeah so like this character is representing a quote unquote you know paramour to lie beneath i mean and, there's a play on that concept of like well and you know, she was appearing to him in a dream exactly exactly so there's a tie here about this particular sort of you know and 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 you can also of course you know tie that into the vampire because they're the mythologies of both can be intertwining if that makes sense depending on which which uh, path you want to take but anyways i think essentially it is trying to communicate that and i'm i'm the the and the reason why i'm trying to go back to sort of the the german work of it's probably pretty much the same which is it means in google translate it generally translates to the word original exactly but uh, you know if, if it is the same it's still like um what i'm trying to say is that you know you, you have this play on the concept of this character who is kind of like a lie there's an exterior of like beauty and kind of attraction and has to do reproduction and kind of but it's a, it's ultimately behind that layer is a lie, right? The concept behind this this sort of character uh, is that you know the so I mean I'm just reading off the Wikipedia, but actually I have heard of this from before. So there's some so if you look at this, it traces back further. It says in folklore, uh, according to the Jewish mystical work Zohar. <laughs> And some rabbinic texts from uh, some earlier days, you know, some some old document. You know, there's this mythology about Adam's first wife, which is not Eve, it's Lilith. And Lilith would later become succubus, which is the origin of a lot of the mythology for um, the the vampire legends. Is that Mm -hmm. Lilith, the the mythological character is the progenitor mother figure of the vampire species, quote unquote, what, what not. And there's more, there's more beyond that, but that's, that's high level kind of, you know, it, that's the intertwining between succubus and vampire legends and stuff like that. 
So if you like watch a lot of uh, vampire type uh, uh, TV movies, uh, very popular ones called True Blood recently. Well, as recent as I remember on that series, it actually does spoiler alert makes a link between the vampires of today and Lilith, the quote unquote for original woman, which is kind of like the succubus character, you know? Anyway, long story short, I think the link behind that is that it's kind of like a, the presentation of this character is like, it's supposed to be some sort of like a demonic slash lie where, uh, it's almost like the, uh, Odyssey skill and Charybdis too, where there's like, there's external beauty, but behind that is this monstrous things that will devour you basically. Right. Mm. And kind of genuine is the play on the fact that her name is genuine, but she's not genuine, obviously. I mean, she's trying to be this authentic person, genuine, right? Whatever meaning you pour into that word, to be true, to be whatever. But in reality, right, behind the facade, she's actually something else, right? She'll cause, in the the context of the film itself, she's causing you know, uh, one of the other characters to commit murder and on and on and on, right? So I, I think in terms of the film title, that's that's kind of the whole uh, thing they were trying to go. She's is, a uh, fraud. Yeah. The the translation, I think, the original German title that they translate is called Genuine, The Tragedy of a Strange House. So basically it's a play on the concept that everybody was lying in the movie, like la, the old guy that looks like Nosferatu. <laughs> yep. Anyways. But... Uh, the old limping guy, right? Who is Lord uh, Milo, you know? Oh, just, I guess, to kind of summarize for people who haven't seen this movie, I'll give a quick summary of the plot. The plot is that there's an artist who drew a painting and he didn't want to sell the painting. So then he falls asleep reading a story about the genuine mythology, you know, of of, of the character. And, of course, during his dream, he dreams about this female character genuine that of, from from which he painted basically you know playing essentially succubus character and trying to seduce you know all these mere characters and one of convinces one of them to murder somebody and uh, to just do all sorts of different things just a lot of uh supernatural uh mind control type of concept and at the end uh ultimately uh we find out at the end that uh, it is a, a dream and he wakes up and then ultimately he sells the painting but that's kind of the plot high level plot but I personally didn't find it as good and well thought out as Dr. Caligari uh, because you know, that's a high watermark right to, uh, and maybe he's made many other movies that were just as good if not better than Caligari but we won't know until they're either found or like I said just don't know because they're all lost right the, most of his filmography is lost, which is sad. But if there was a way to determine, you'd, you'd have to watch all of his films and then make a, a assert, ascertain which one is the best, right? But of the ones that we have, it's certainly more strong, you know. I personally like The Hands of Arlock as well. I don't know if I like that one better. Maybe I do than Caligari, but it's just a more... Um, Anyways, that's just comparing those two. This specific one, it would just be interesting if you were an audience in 1920 be like, you just saw this high mark of this amazing movie, right? And then you're kind of, at least I would be, and I'd be excited to kind of go back to the same director saying, I would like to check out his follow-up to this amazing movie. And all of a sudden you're like disappointed because he basically didn't do the same thing that you wanted. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. also just filmically, you know, it, it just wasn't as good. So, and then he did uh, Hands of Orlock after this in 1924. So he did this, and then later on he did uh, film uh, the uh, uh, the Hands of Orlock. I mean, he he would do he would go on to do many other movies before he did, did the Hands of Orlock. But, anyways, does that make sense? Yep, I think so. So I I didn't feel like it was as good as the other one, uh, but. Were there? What were your questions, Lily, on the plot? I I know you read it already, right? The the plot summary and the wiki. Mm -hmm. So, did it clarify things for you, or were there things that were still confused? Um, confusing? I think it did. Uh, just because I believe 
with the Wikipedia page, uh, it was referencing the shorter version, the f- about the 45-minute one. Right. And because it kind of shrunk it down, it was easier to take as a whole. Right. So I could kind of piece together the rest of the film and just... Because, you know, at the rest of the other half hour of it is just a continuation of what's going on. So I was like, okay, makes right. sense. Um, so I think it did. I... I mean, I don't know if I would want to watch it again, like you said, but maybe watching the 45-minute version to see how it's done differently. Oh, yeah, sure. I didn't watch that. I only watched the the full, complete version, or as complete as possible. <sighs> what do you guys think of the sets? Because really, the key of German Expressionistic style and genre is really all about the the dark, moody sets. I thought the artistry was amazing. Right. Um, because as I was watching the film, I was really um, trying to decide, do I like this? You know, right. because mm-hmm. on the one hand, I said, okay, it's very artistic. It's very interesting that he doesn't use any, like the ceilings are never level and uh, doorways are seem crooked and the artistry on everywhere a lot of painted mirrors and painted glass and everything is painted weirdly and costumes are strange and hairdos are strange and like you know, a dream. it's a dream <laughs> See? and he's and he's not only is it a dream but he's also setting um the feeling like as i watched it like i was crazy i was going crazy just watching it you know because yeah. nothing was as i felt like it was so hard getting a grip on you know, it's just so crazy to watch. Um, and I liked that. In a way, I liked it. In a way, I didn't like it. So I was sitting there going, Ugh, you know. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah. Uh, all in all, I, I came away, you know, at the end of the movie, I was questioning, did I like this? And after I described it to my brother, it, it was obvious that there were so many things I appreciated about it that the, I said, yeah, I did like it. Okay. Artistically. Yeah, no, that's the feature, and not a bug, as it were, as they, people talk about in software. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's my feelings about it, is that it uh, wasn't as good as the other stuff, uh, but, like, you know, the, the highlights of German Expressionistic films are have always been just the sets and the artistry behind all that, and it is... Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that to watch it is a trip. Yes. <laughs> Um, it is, it, you know, I don't know if it's, uh, I don't know if concern's the right word, but I just feel like, I don't know if he's like a one-trick pony, right? Where all of his films are kind of just the same. Because <laughs> so far, I think all of his films, they don't always take place in a dream, but mm. they do often take place in this, uh, there are elements of manic slash dreamlike states that the characters get tortured through mm-hmm. that at the other end um you know i i think orlock there were dreams in there too but the whole movie wasn't a dream but i just want to like like his exploration of sort of the deep psyches and darknesses of all these different characters and you know what's lurking in the shadows of their own psyches i think that's like he loves exploring that and i feel like almost so far even in fear like all of his films have some element of that of like there's this dark brooding dreamlike quality psyche of yourself in or other characters that like the like exploring the madness of that you know you know what i'm saying like i feel like that's a motif that he often deals with and i'm just wondering if he actually has done other movies that don't deal with that. Does that make sense? Like, I would have a hard time watching a Robert Wien movie where, like, he does, like, a Sound of the Music or, I don't know, making things up. Like, something more cheery, right? Something more... Uh, it less... wouldn't feel right. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, and like I said, I don't know if it's because all of his peers are doing the same things and he's kind of just like, well, if you're doing that, I'm going to keep doing that. Or, or he just likes doing that. I don't know. Like... Because he, he likes using um, the set 
uh, guy, what's his name here on the week? Uh, Cesar Klein, who's a production designer, you know, even from Caligari. And they're all, that artistry is all very similar. So I'm just wondering if he keeps kind of using the same technique from here on or actually he tries to swing for the fences and does something else later on. You know what I mean? There's only about a couple more movies of his, I think, that survived and is unavailable to us. And so we'll see. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited to explore if he does kind of get away from this kind of idea and motif or he kind of just, you know, goes all in on it. You know what I mean? Hmm. Anyways. Because I've seen clips, um, photos and stuff of Caligari. Caligari's. Is oh, it's it the absolutely cabinet? one of the best. Is absolutely. it the cabinet or the bookcase? Uh, the cabinet of is you know obviously of Dr. Caligari. Right, yeah. So it's the the cabinet yeah, of Dr. Caligari. Yeah. yeah, I've seen clips from that, and it looks very similar in artistry to this one. It's clearly, it is one of the best like movies of of all time. Just like City Lights, you know, when you run down a list of like silent films. Uh, people put stuff like City Lights, you know, Potemkin, uh, uh, Galakari down. Like, it's one of those. It's that high of a level of quality. You know what I mean? Because I even tried telling my dad today if he's ever seen um, Caligari, and he's like, no. But I told him, I'm sure you've seen clips of it, because, right. you know, he's 66, so there's no way he's gotten through his life without possibly witnessing, like, the most famous clips from it, like, when uh Cesar's climbing up the oh the hill I guess you could call with the woman or even right. the poster I mean it's so iconic right anyways yeah check that out uh Bob when you have time I think there are many copies and versions of it on YouTube as well oh I will. Yeah, I will it's it's pretty uh iconic Julie says Actually, your or, brother probably might be interested because you guys just went through Hitchcock, right? It, yep. it, it definitely influenced Hitchcock for sure. <laughs> he would have uh, known about it before he made his own stuff. Or even uh-huh. better, Bob, you could listen to our podcast. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> After I see it. Yeah. Okay, fair. I, I don't like knowing about a movie before I see it. Yeah, I know. We kind of, uh, we, we don't kinda really. We kind of spoil it. <laughs> yeah, we kind of, well, we figure it's been 100 plus years for a lot of these films, and we're like, yeah. what's mm-hmm. the point in doing yeah. pre and after spoilers? If you ever want to change the name, you can, get spo- you can go Spoilers or Us. <laughs> <laughs> Silent podcast, Spoilers right? or Us. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a new offshoot, right? Yeah. Anyways, that's our thoughts on it. Um, any parting thoughts before we wrap up? Um, it's funny, I'll, I'll say this about the film, one of the th- thoughts I had throughout the film is genuine. Um, there were there were some scenes that I thought, well, first, um, some, of the, some of the translation of the subtitles was off, so whoever they got was a German speaker and made some errors in the translations, I noticed. Um, but secondly... Um, I thought it was very interesting that the guy had, throughout the film, she went through a number of different costumes. And now, granted, it's a dream. So, But in this dream, he, he had an amazing wardrobe for her. <laughs> With very strange mm-hmm. outfits. <laughs> oh, yes. I thought, that's a very interesting twist there. Like, Granted, you're not supposed to be realizing it's a dream, but then... You know, he went out and got all those really bizarre clothes, I guess, knowing her mm-hmm. taste, you know? <laughs> I guess, though, it makes sense because she is supposed to be that seductress, so she wants to have, she's supposed to have the finest clothes, even right. if it is a dream. Because really, right. the men don't seem to change their outfits, but she's the one character that right. always seems to have something new or flattering or yep. whatever. And, and the other thing was when he wrote to his friend and said, please visit and bring all your wife's finest jewelry with you. <laughs> Oh, that would that doesn't sound suspicious at all. <laughs> that's funny. See, that's something I wish I could have understood. <laughs> did you guys? Did you guys catch one last thing? I before we wrap up is that did you guys catch the fact that 
all of the characters he met before the dream was in his dream. Does that? Did you guys? Catch I realized that? that at the very end. That's what yeah. made me think of the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yep. yeah. I thought that was very funny. I mean, yeah. when he, but what I did think it was really strange when he woke up and found the the dagger on his bed or, or on his couch when he woke up. Right. It was like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> just just an element of mystery that. Well, that's you know, the thing that he likes to do. Is that's all part of his sort of exploration of the deep deep psyche of like did it happen was it real was it not real that's a a uh branch of the things that he likes to explore in the dark psyches of mm-hmm. you know that's what mm-hmm. he likes so anywho i i just supposed the dagger was in his study and that he incorporated it into the dream yeah that's what we're potentially made to think <laughs> that's one of those uh he likes to have that open interpretation where at the yep. end you know is it this is it that and yeah, mm. it's part of the entertainment is, is yep. to, to figure that out and, that, and that's all i got <laughs> lily parting thoughts uh i don't know i'm not sure what i should say more i think i said my piece i mean it just i i uh, I don't know. I feel like I couldn't really contribute to this particular movie because it was very sporadic for me. I, yeah, I, uh, I watched the film over two days, which, you know, which was, uh, I watched the majority of it yesterday and then I finished it earlier today, but I, it, I don't know. I think the best way is just the internet needs to tell me how I can understand this film better and like how I, I, do we enjoy it. I don't it think or... I don't think you're that far off the mark, which is why I'm trying to put that in the context of mm-hmm. the Caligari thing. Because if you were like you said, like I said before, if you were an audience in 1919 and you're like Caligari is amazing movie, mm. and in his next one you're like you're, you're going to be super excited to to try and catch. Yeah, of course. And it kind of lets you down, and I, uh, I, I, I felt that way, and I, uh, mm. I know Bob hasn't seen that, but it's it's not as tightly edited and written, and you know mm. there are pieces, set pieces that are. I nice. can feel that. I can feel yeah. that because as I watched the film, I, I even though I could see the subtitles, I still was lost a lot of the time. I was like, right, it it I wasn't, don't... it didn't explain all the characters' motives very well. Right. I also wonder too, not that this is like anything specific but because it's centered around a woman if it makes it any different you know because yeah. uh what the character is supposed to be but i feel like that would make her that much more compelling right yeah because exactly. she is like supposed to be a devious creature right and i don't know it's like it's a hit or miss for me with her character she's like i don't know i'm like twiddling my fingers over here like she's spooky but she's also kind of lame i don't know it could be <laughs> <laughs> what is it genuine part two <laughs> yeah like maybe <laughs> maybe it's just not that well realized i think i think there's just uh pieces and elements of potentially to make a, a classic and maybe a great movie mm. i just don't think that you know yeah it was well executed yeah exactly respect. yeah yeah that's what i mean so. I mean, if we saw it live a hundred years ago, I'm sure we would have been like, "This is amazing!" You know, uh, clap, 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 clap. Maybe, <laughs> but I mean, the, I mean, the reality is, it didn't do the same box office. It didn't make a lot of money compared to um, Caligari and other films. So it's even the audiences we, back then didn't, didn't vote with their dollars, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, that says something. Interesting concept. Not always yeah. true, but it it potentially says something. Hmm. Anywho. Yeah, and I think another reason why, you know, this, uh, I was going to call it a play. Huh, I guess it's like a play. Uh, this film wasn't as straightforward is you don't understand the characters. Not while well, they're reasoning so much. I, I think it's, uh, I wasn't sure if it was Percy or Florian who kills Mr. Milo, the, the business guy. He, like, slits his throat with the, the straight razor, and I'm just like, why? I mean, she genuinely supposedly seduces him to do that, but I still didn't think, uh, you know, it's just not well execution. Like, he, none of these characters really had any goals. I think that's another thing that's bothering me. It's like, no one really wanted anything. They were kind of just there. Right. And 
I think I, <laughs> I think I'm gonna, I think that's my piece at this point because I'm just gonna keep going in circles. Like, but well, I but agree then, with you. I mean, hmm. and, and part of it is like he can excuse that by saying it's all the dream. But even in, I feel like, what do you do? Well, I feel like, you know, in his other movies where there are dream sequences, like at least it it was compelling. I I don't think yeah. that the dream sequence, even if you use the excuse that it's all a dream, was compelling enough and. You just like you know it was Florian, by the way, who did that. But the point is, you know, it just wasn't um, okay. well realized. I think that's. But you know, I I think that you know silent films, it none of not all of them have to be super amazing or classics, right? Sometimes they're just a piece of film that somebody found that we we have access to and we can watch. But it doesn't mean like, you know, like for example, uh, using today's example, like a hundred years from now, well. We don't know if like Step Brothers or you know, oh please, it's gonna be an amazing movie. You know, hundred years from now, maybe it will be. I don't know, but the point is, I hope I'm not around. <laughs> yes, but you, you you get my point. You, you can just name any movie that today's audience thinks like, yeah, it's not that great a movie, right? But then like a hundred years from now, how are they gonna experience it and watch it, right? Maybe they'll watch it with the same lens, or maybe they won't. Maybe they think that's the, you know. It, it, there are instances where, uh, you know, classic movies do get revived and do get their comeuppance, I guess. I mean, or, Orson Welles' uh, The Citizen Kane is the perfect example where when it was released, it was uh, it, it was basically bagged by the media because the movie was about this William Hurst character, right? Right. And William Hurst owns all the news media back then. Uh. And so he was like, I don't want this movie to portray me it really wasn't about him specifically but i think that you know you know he basically you know bagged the whole movie and it was it was not very popular when the citizens and Kane movie was released but decades after um after revivals it's like one of the best people deem it to be one of the number it's often in number top 10 top fives Number yeah. one movies of all time on many many on many lists. lists number many one, yeah, number American one on many films. lists, yeah. Right. So you got an example like that where it was a classic then, and and if you view it now, it's still a very amazing classic movie. But you know, you can take any other like even Orson Welles from his filmography. You can take many of his films he made before, or after, and uh, may not before, but like after that, and you view it and you're like, mm, I don't know, it's okay. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like he's made many movies. Uh, I've seen uh, a number of them, and they're all not as good as like Citizen Kane. You know. Mm. So my point is, uh, not every movie by an artist who previously made something good doesn't mean that they're no. going to continue to make good stuff. Everybody's right. going to have a mixture of like. It's very incredibly rare to have a rich, just through and through filmography. You know, from from start to finish. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, it's never, it, mm-hmm. th- that never happens. Right. Right. The best directors that that never happens. Yeah. Anyway, so that's why I think about this one is it's okay to be like mm, not as good. I, I think we're we can do that. So. <laughs> I, I I will I will agree with you having not seen the first one, but even by reputation, I don't believe it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that concludes our podcast for today, and. Um, for more of our stuff, you can find more of our stuff rather at uh, watching silent films that wordpress.com. That's watching silent films plural that wordpress.com. The same word, watching silent films at gmail.com. If you have any questions, thoughts, or comments. And uh, if you wouldn't mind leaving a review on our uh, Apple Podcast platform, um, where if you get your podcast through there or any other platform you get, please uh, put some star rating or reviews. It would greatly help uh, introduce us to other film lovers uh, especially of the silent film uh, era um, and that's pretty much it for today so this episode is produced by Lillian uh, edited by Fong and uh, thanks everyone thanks listeners we'll see you soon good night peace night. out